this looks really, this is a full room, but business is so boring, I'm surprised you guys are all here. It's, uh, it's funny. <laughs> exactly. Um, so thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Randy Meach, and this talk is OSMBA, um, and it's you know the history and future of companies in OpenStreetMap. And I do not have an MBA. I actually studied literature and religious studies. Um, and I'll just go over my background a little bit, so it you know makes sense that I'm talking about this at all. Um, so I started in tech um, at the end of the 90s tech bubble, and then as um, things kind of fell apart, I luckily went to Google and spent five years there, which was, which was amazing. And I did startups after that, one of which was acquired by AOL, where I became head of engineering for MapQuest, where we launched um, all of the open, open street map tools that MapQuest um, supported back then around the 2010 timeframe. Um, now I'm CEO of Mapsen, which is based out of the Samsung Accelerator, where uh, the closing party is, I think, tomorrow night, so I hope to see everybody there. Um, and actually, I just I, I, this has happened a few times in a few different talks. I think Mikkel did this. It happened, I think, in the last uh, session as well. But how many people here, show of hands, work on OSM professionally? I think it would be more in this talk, probably, because uh, actually not, not so much. Um, yeah, I just I think it's an interesting question. So uh, let's get started. So the origin of OpenStreetMap, I think it's, it's pretty well known, it was uh, founded by Steve Coast in 2004. Um, and he wanted to make a map. He was in the UK at a very practical need. He wanted to do a map, and it was very difficult to do it. Um, you may be familiar with the Ordnance Survey, which holds official map data in the UK. But this was really inaccessible, and it was expensive for indiv individual developers. It just really wasn't an option. And of course, there are bigger companies that would have had this data as well, but also not an option back then. So, you know, looking at the success of Wikipedia and crowdsourcing, um, he started this project with a bunch of early contributors, many of whom are here, which is great. Um, and I think that this was a, it was a, it was a good time to start because it, there was the arrival of good, you know, affordable handheld GPS technology, um, as, as well as you know, a proven crowd, crowdsourcing model with with Wikipedia. So it's a good confluence of events. And um, Steve was kind enough to let me interview him for this talk. And I asked, one of the questions I asked him was if um, they thought at all in the early days about enabling future businesses when they started. And his answer was, was pretty quick. He said that they were thinking more about disrupting existing models. Like, for example, it was difficult to get data um, from Ordnance Survey. So this was much more of a disruptive crowdsourced effort rather than like the blueprint for future businesses. Um, you know, uh, FYI, there, there are currently four global map data sets. There's you know, uh, uh, Nokia's, Navtech, TomTom's, Teleatlas, OpenStreetMap, and Google. But back then, there were only two, and then a lot of regional data sets as well. So two years after OpenStreetMap was founded, Steve started the, the OSMF. And this is a UK not-for-profit company. Um, you know, so we've had some talks about it today. Kathleen talked earlier. Uh, Kate Chapman talked yesterday, had a really good talk, too. So there, there are folks here from the OSMF. But I really want to think back to, to that time and what an interesting move that was. There's a lot of things that could have been done instead of starting the OSMF, which is a group, you know, not-for-profit that's charged with, you know, um, growing the project and taking care of the project. Steve could have made this a company. Um, it could have been dual licensed. There's many, many different options that could have happened for this. Or it could have been something more like the Wikimedia Foundation, which is a, you know, which is a very strong, like, centrally controlled project. Instead, it's, it's a database that people can use and share. Um, so it's, I, I just think it's a really interesting model that, that provides a lot of you know, opportunity for, for us now. But um, there's tension. You, know, you just need to look at the mailing lists or look at blog posts. There, there are arguments over the license and whether it's fit for business. And we'll get into this a little bit. So we'll start with the license, which I'm not going to argue about personally. I'm just going to describe it. So at the time of you know, when it was founded, um, it was CC by SA, which was chosen. It's similar to Wikipedia. With OpenStreetMap, this has been replaced by ODBL, which is more or less the same, you know, has the same, is the same thing. I won't get super into that. But the thing about the license is it allows you to use it for any purpose, commercial um, or not. Um, you, all you have to do is two things. You need to give attribution to the creators of the data, and you need to share back any improvements that you make. So the license was chosen to benefit the project and to ensure its growth. And there, there's a slight fear that the data would be taken, improved, maybe by a company and not shared back. And there, there's, there is a tinge, you know, sometimes about, you know, maybe there's a resentment of companies using my data or the data that, that, I, that I created. Why should someone profit off this? But um, it's important to note 
free software culture is strongly against limiting use. So it's, it's okay to require attribution and require share alike and still be free. And OpenStreetMap is rooted in free software culture. So you can read about the GPLs for freedoms or the open definition. I actually have a syllabus at the end of this. If you go to my Twitter page, I have a pinned tweet that, that gives um, some articles about this if you want to any, read any more about this. But these things are very similar. Um, so, you know, there are arguments about the license, but clearly something works. You know, that we, we argue about how well it works for businesses and if it could be better, but this is a, there's a you know, huge number of people at this conference. Clearly something happened. We're at the UN. The data set's amazing. These have been two days of amazing projects, humanitarian, commercial, all kinds of interesting stuff. So I just want to, you know, pause and say that something's working. Sorry, just going to grab some water. And there's also a number of businesses here. You know, we have um, folks from Apple, there's Facebook here, Twitter, ESRI, Microsoft, Amazon, all, all in attendance, I, I believe. And not all of them are using the data, but the fact that everyone's here, it's, it's, I think it's very interesting. So yeah, something's working, even if there are, you know, some problems. So there's been a lot of writing on this topic lately. Actually, since I got this talk approved, so much has happened and so much is, is about to happen that it's been kind of tough to like to plan it. Um, and you know, I was, I was kind of worried there'd be last minute announcements of things today, but that didn't happen. So one article that I linked to in the syllabus um, at, the, at the very end is something by Gary, uh, so a piece that Gary Gale wrote in GeoHipster. And I actually, you know, now that I'm reading it in my notes, I'm not sure if it's appropriate for me to say, but it's, it's basically, the article says, it argues against uh, CC by SA and claims it's holding the project back. I'm not going to argue it here, but I do want to um, highlight a response uh, by, from Simon Poole's diary entry, which I also link to later. And he points out, among other things, that because there's no strong central organization like Wikimedia, OSMF leaves a lot of room for companies to build on top of it. It's actually very permissive. It's very liberal. This absolutely hasn't happened with, with Wikipedia. There's no business ecosystem. Like, think about this for a second. There's no, like, opportunity for a map box to be created off, off of Wikipedia because it's so strong and centrally controlled. And this goes back to very early choices in the project about what the OSMF should do or shouldn't do. So from this angle, you could argue that OSM is incredibly business friend friendly and very generous. So just, you know, if we stop and think about all the freedoms we have with this data, I think it's kind of amazing. But, you know, there's tension. You know, anyone who's been around OSM for a while knows this. You know, visible companies come and go, build on top of OpenStreetMap. But really, you know, one of my main points here today is the same freedom given to businesses uh, by the OSMF and the fact that there's no wikipedia.org controlling things creates a vacuum for companies to come along and productize OpenStreetMap. And this productization is, uh, I think, a core core tension that happens here. So CloudMade did this once. I did it at MapQuest. Now again at MapSend. Map, Mapbox does this as well and is the biggest and most successful example of this. But the vacuum created by this provides an opportunity for companies to come along and, and do this stuff really well. So this is an anonymous email I got. Um, and it says, you know, basically, you know, from some services that from Open Map Quest and nom, you know investments that we did there at Nominatum and Vector Tiles and geocoding at Mapsin, I don't actually believe it's true that I've done the most here. I think a lot of other people have. Um, but this contention is that OSM should be running these services, which requires budget and staffing, and you you need to fundraise, you need to do things like this. Should the OSMF or some central group do this? I'm not going to really say that. It's just something for, for discussion. I think that we've, you know, as a community have made choices over the years and what we have here is something where businesses will come in and, and do this. So how many people remember CloudMade? Can we see a show of hands? Actually, that's about less than half. That's really interesting. So you might find their business familiar, right? So they, one thing that they did was they allowed users to style their own maps. They hosted tiles for a fee. They invested heavily in MapNIC, which is ma uh, map rendering technology. Um, they launched Leaflet. They launched an iOS SDK to use OpenStreetMap data, and they worked to improve the data. Thea Clay's here. She used to work there. Say hi to her. She's great. Um, and most of these things have been done several times since then by different companies. You know, um, you know, at OpenMapQuest, we did a lot of this stuff. Mapbox, again, does this very well. We're doing some of the same stuff at MapSen. So, the market will fill the void. You know, this, again, going back to the Wikipedia example, if Wikipedia had just been a database with no service offerings, I think the same things would have, been happen, would have happened. 
So CloudMate had some problems, you know, like everything in business. There was some of it was timing, some of it was execution. I think it might have been a bit too early for the market. The data might not have been good enough yet for a lot of use cases. Again, this was like the two, I think the 2008, 2009 timeframe. And Google as a, as a map API was new and popular and free. And there were also some community struggles, um, again, about the productizing of OpenStreetMap and how, how controversial that might be. And again, about blurring lines between what OpenStreetMap is, the community, and what, what the business is. That's also a tricky thing. And you know, they're a VC-funded startup, which is great, unless things go wrong. And then you, they, they pivoted a number of times, and now they're in a completely different field, although they do still exist. And here is a, a TechCrunch article, which I link to in, in the syllabus later on. Um, but this, this headline shows CloudMade's OpenStreetMap. You see this, there's always this tension about the businesses, are they claiming ownership of the project? Are they blurring the lines a little bit too much? This is something that comes up a little bit. It came up quite, quite a bit um, with, with TechCrunch. You know, you know, th did they give a sense that the business can drive the community? It's, it's, it's hard to do that, especially in, in OpenStreetMap. Here's another an anonymous quote from a community member who let me um, interview him for this, which is super useful. Um, it sums up, again, one of the key struggles between a charismatic business and the OpenStreetMap community. Um, and, and one thing about doing something as a business is it's your full-time job. You get to really focus on it. You can hire other people. You can do marketing, design, teaching, and this attracts a much bigger community with more novices and more people. But um, my contention is that with the founding principles of OpenStreetMap, this, this will happen inevitably. Businesses will always do this. Um, you know, there's too strong a vacuum and too strong an opportunity. And I think that if the company's doing it now were to vanish, others would appear immediately. It's kind of like, kind of like drug dealers, you know? One, <laughs> one, one leaves the street and the other one comes back up. So, wow, it's, oh, we're already 15 minutes in. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about MapQuest. So this, I mentioned that I was there and um, I can talk a lot about this because I was there. I love MapQuest. You know they started in the 1960s. It was um, the advent of commercial computing with maps. It's a really interesting company. And in 1996, they put a map on the web. And I just, I wanna pause and think about this and acknowledge it because it's really amazing and it's, I think, forgotten. You know, MapQuest was really the first uh, web application that most people used. Back in the mid 90s, there was a lot of static content. You would read you know, text. But map, with MapQuest, you could press a button and something would change. And people could drive to different places. They could go somewhere that they, they could confidently drive somewhere where they you know, couldn't have gone before. So it's a very important site, basically, very revolutionary, frankly. Um, also, it was the first billion dollar uh, mapping acquisition. Waze was the most recent, but this was in 1999, 2000. And right around that time frame, actually, I should note that Excited Home bought Blue Mountain Arts, which is a greeting card company, for 780 million. So maybe there's a little bit of a bubble, but still, it's a, it's a, it's a big deal. So what went wrong with MapQuest? Um, <laughs> I guess, <laughs> wow, I wasn't expecting that. But this is, this is Gerald Levin and um, St uh, Steve Case uh, from Time Warner and AOL. My opinion, um, after being there for a while, was that you know MapQuest was acquired by AOL. I, this, I was there way after this, but MapQuest was acquired by AOL right around the time of the AOL Time Warner merger. This is regarded as the worst business deal in, in history, a total catastrophe. Um, it was the combination of a traditional media company with a hot internet company, and AOL, the internet folks, came in strong and cocky. The internet bubble collapsed. Um, took a one-time write-off of $99 billion. 99, that's a B, billion dollars. And the stock value went from 226 billion to 20 billion. It's like, it's, you can't even imagine it today, really. Um, so Time Warner got the upper hand, treated AOL like a cash cow, including MapQuest. And when I showed up, you know, it was, it was very, there was a team that really wanted to innovate, but they weren't really able to do much. For, for example, um, if you searched for an address, they would have a search, you know, disambiguation page, which would say, did you mean one Main Street? Even if there was only one Main Street result. And it's because they wanted to show an ad. So it was very difficult, um, especially as Google Maps came in. And I was at Google when that launched, which was great. But, um, you know, it, wasn't great later when I, when I was there. So what kind of, what kind of strategy uh, did, did we implement? Um, you know, we, looking at OpenStreetMap and having come from a startup that had done a lot of work um, with, with OpenStreetMap, you know, we just decided to hopefully invigorate a developer community by supporting some of this stuff. And here's a Wall Street Journal article from, it's actually right after a state of the map in Girona, Spain. And you can see here, we made a very clear line between what the community is and what, what the company was. Um, and yeah, so that, that's, this is basically the, the announcement uh, for, for that. So 
there wasn't really much of a turnaround strategy, but this was kind of something that we thought might be might be interesting. We, we pledged a million dollars to help um, support OpenStreetMap, and I wasn't really sure what that meant at the time, to be honest. You know, um, if anyone saw Kate Chapman's talk, it's about like there, there's an you know an organization. Well, having talked to Kate, organizations need to be ready to receive that. There wasn't really a, an organization ready to receive it, so we did a lot of internal development and outreach and things like that. Um, here's an example of. The site we launched, you can see this in the Nominatum geocoder. Um, it's it's a it's as we relaunched MapQuest, it was the same kind of interface there. So it was it was good. A lot of work on Mapnik, Nominatum, routing services, satellite imagery, uh, stuff like that. So let's talk about disruption quickly because this gets into some later parts of the talk, and I'm going to start going a little bit faster because I don't I think this is like an hour and a half talk now that I, <laughs> now that I think about it. So disruptions is a very overused word with startups, um, but Cl this guy Clayton, Clayton Christensen wrote this book, The Innovator's Dilemma. The Economist called it one of the six most important business books of all time, and basically it describes the um, the problem of a successful business like MapQuest back in the day that's unable to compete with certain competitors because competing would cannibalize the core business. So it's easy to dismiss the, the competitors because they look cheap, they look like toys, they don't look super professional. But what happens is the quality gap closes before um, the incumbent can really respond and they basically go out of business. And I think this is something that, that happened there. So MapQuest made a lot of money selling store locators. So when the Google Maps API came out, which was free, they said they had a sales team and they said, oh, you know, these are our customers want, you know, they need support. They need, you know, more professional services. Not so true <laughs> after a while. This is a great book um, if you're interested in these topics. But this comes back to us in the mapping industry and with OpenStreetMap. Uh, so this, there's this year, 2007, which I like to call peak proprietary map data. Well, I'm not sure. If we'll see what happens. But it's an amazing year, right? So July, TomTom Tom offers $2.8 billion for Teleatlas, one of the global map data sets. In October, two things happen. Nokia acquires Navtech for $8.1 billion. Like, think about that when you see what Nokia is going to sell for sh shortly. October. <laughs> Garmin bids 3.3 billion for Teleatlas, and then in December, you know, TomTom Tom ups its bid to 4.3 billion dollars. So it's all of this frenzy of activity um, happens around there, and then what happens? There's an, another great article. It's called Less Than Free, um, which I link to later on, which you know you should read. Um, Google does a lot of really interesting moves. It drops Na Nokia as a map provider. The rumor is that Nokia, who had acquired Navtech, which is the, the data provider, didn't want to give them a very good deal for Android because it would have been competitive to Nokia at the time. Uh, so Google starts driving their own cars. This is probably cheaper than the Nokia uh, data deal that they would have given. This is like kind of hearsay, but um, in October 2009, Google drops TomTom, who they also been using, and now Google is running 100% on its own data. So 2009, this is a really key moment. Google offers free turn-by-turn -turn nav on Android, which is a big move that caused Garmin, TomTom, and Nokia to panic and their stocks to fall. And again, uh, you should read this article, Less Than Free, which I link to later. Um, and it's an amazing thing about Google because the bigger they get, they can still disrupt whole markets like this. Usually it's a smaller startup or upstart that, that does this, but, but yeah, they're, they're amazing. So what happened after this? Um, this article is actually from October of last year, and you just need to read the news about Nokia here to see what happened. Uh, this author looked up the financial data for Nokia and TomTom, and, and, and the entire industry is basically gutted. He, he concludes there's not much money to be made in mobile and internet maps. He looks at the Apple deal with TomTom, and he says there's no significant revenue coming out of this deal despite the number of users they have. And the, 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 the bottom line I find fascinating, Google has been sucking all the value out of this market, and if that was not enough, OpenStreetMap is finishing the job, which, <laughs> yeah, I wasn't sure if that was a good thing or, <laughs> or a bad thing. But to give more context to why this is important, you know, mobile is a huge market, so you have Google and Apple. Um, you know, Google invests way more money in mapping than I, I believe they can possibly make back. I'm not sure, but, I, but I, would, I would imagine that. And maps are key to their mobile strategy, right? They're willing to invest profits from other business lines to, to you know, control this market. Look what happened to Apple with their maps. So the iPhone launches in 2007 with Google Maps. Google buys Android Incorporated a year later. Um, a year after that, Apple starts getting uncomfortable and acquires PlaySpace, which is the start of their map project, I believe. You know, I wasn't, wasn't there, but that seems like that from the outside. Um, and we know what happened after this, but this stuff is really key for mobile, which is a, you know, a huge market. 
So what we're talking about here is commoditized data. There's two disruptive forces in mapping. There's Google and there's OpenStreetMap. We're seeing all the value getting sucked out of pr proprietary data vendors. So, you know, I, I personally would like to see the value of that go to zero and for us to do something a little bit more interesting like product development. You know, so when I say commoditize, I mean remove the value that one provider might add over another. Like you look at these things, these are commodities, right? So the market doesn't really care who, who's selling it wheat or where it's wheat is coming from. Wheat is just wheat or corn is just corn. So I feel like data can be the same thing. We can decide that that's a commodity and just build, build interesting stuff on top of it like apps and like, you know, interesting things. So I think we can have the best map data as part of the commons and developers can work on new products that are hard to build now. There aren't enough products in the hands of real users um, but with op open street map data. It's getting better, um, but it's still kind of inaccessible. And so Mapbox is, is an example of a company doing great work. I think the most visible um, doing, doing this stuff, getting it into the hands of new users and new developers, um, you know, working on data in the commons. Alex gave a great talk yesterday about um, f helping to fix the map. You know, users of, of their different services can submit things that they might not want to fix themselves. So, I mean, I think there are some tensions with the community with that because, in, you know, it's direct investment in the data. But unless you think of businesses as part of the community, which, which I do. I do see businesses as part of the community. Oh, that's a weird print. That's supposed to be the, the, the Scobler um, uh, icon. So anyway, Telnav Scobler, who, who are here, um, are another example of a company doing really great things. They've had a number of good talks um, helping to make sure the data is navigable, working on this data in the commons. And it's, they're, they're interesting. They're a very professional, mature public company with a strong sales team. The ability to get this stuff distributed in, in very um, big ways. Um, and they're I think they're interacting really well with the community with the potential, you know, to, to make a big difference here. Um, and so, you know, finally, you know, I, I think that working together, and I love the fact that we're at the United Nations because you can have a slide like this and it seems a little corny, but, you know, hopefully it's true. Um, I'd like to see for all of us to, like, to work together, a community of individuals and businesses, to make this the best data set in the world using our shared resources, which then moves competition away from the data. I mean, think about it. There's all these companies driving around collecting the fact that the UN is here or the pizza place is there. It's just such a waste of effort. Like, let's just, let's just share in this stuff and, and do something. Oh. <laughs> There's so much more interesting stuff to do. It's hard to build a company like Foursquare or Waze because, you know, with Foursquare you need really good location data. It's hard to get. With Waze you need to build a, you know, a big team of, of navigation experts. You need to build data. Let's, you know, let's share in that stuff and, and make it much easier. Let's have a dozen companies like that pop up. It would be so much more interesting. Um, so, yeah, we're still, companies are still trying to productize OpenStreetMap, but there's a lot more work to get to that, you know, to that where we're doing more interesting products on top of the data. Geocoding isn't great. Navigation needs improvement. There's a lot of things that, that we, need, we need to work on. So let's focus on this. Um, yeah, so that's it. Any um, questions, comments? Questions veiled as comments? Uh, yes. So it, it seems like a lot of the acquisitions that are going on now, what's driving it is perhaps driverless cars. Um, you know, do you, what do you see the future trends in business? What do you think is going to drive consolidation or um, do you think the factors that are in the market are going to drive this convergence to data as a commodity or fracture it further? Well, I would hope that some of this can, ha you know, can happen in the commons where w the, the question, I mean, for me is like, where does the value actually go? Like if the data is commoditized, if the services are to some extent commoditized, where does the, where does the value go? And it goes to, it goes to um, like user interactions, it goes to products, it goes to interesting social things that happen over that. So. Um, in terms of a lot of the value that you're seeing now, it's the on-demand economy, you need navigation services, you need things like that. Like, I would love to see that get solved in the commons and have apps on top of it that, that can provide value, you know. Um, like Waze, for example, right? What was the value of Waze? Is it the social activity on, on top or is it, is it the data and the technology? I mean, it's, 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 I don't know, it's hard to, hard to talk about, but I would like to see that value kind of step up. Does that answer your question? Yes. Uh, another idea of data as a commodity, two things that are between a real commodity and the current set of OSM data is 
Number one, you actually pay for a commodity. The oil isn't free. And number two, once you have it, you can do whatever you want with it. You can burn it, you can put it, you make it into jet fuel, whatever the hell. How, how do we get the OSM model from here to there? Or, I mean, do we get the OSM model from here to there? Yeah, so I think, well, in terms of paying for a commodity, like, I mean, you, you still, there is still a cost in this. It's just a cost that kind of gets driven to, it, you're not you're not competing over value add right on top of it. I'm not I'm not going to offer different OSM data than someone else and be able to charge much more. You know, so I think it sort of like brings it to in that, in this case it would be like data costs and things like that. Um, and then I'm sorry, what was it? Once you buy, you can do what you want with it. Which right. Is not, again, not so I actually I personally think that in terms of the license, there's some you know clarifications that should be made, and I think we're moving in that direction. Geocoding is one of the one of the big hot button issues, but I do think it's pretty permissive. I mean, I think you can do any you can do anything you want with this data, with two with two things. You need to to give attribution, um, and you need to share any improvements that you make to it. And personally, you know, having been at MapQuest and having done deals with you know some of the bigger global um, data set providers. That's actually extremely permissive. You know, if you do any contract with like someone where you're buying data from, the contract's like this big about what you can do, what you can't do. It's 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 tougher than this. Some things need to be clarified. I think we can definitely do that. Yes. It turns red when it when it goes on. Oh. There you go. Um, Really curious about any thoughts on how uh, governments can be involved in this idea of a data commons and how they might cooperate with private entities uh, to make that easier to do or, or, or provide some leverage there? Any just basic thoughts? Sure. I mean, yeah, we, you know, we've been doing a lot of work. There's a lot of interesting work happening with governments and government data. I think just opening the data and, and providing it in a way that's accessible and like liberally licensed is big. You know, again, like, like I was saying before, there are, there are businesses ready to fill vacuums and help out like there's plenty of businesses that would that would would and are helping out um, in, in that case uh, you know Mapbox for example did a lot of work with um, New York City opened its Pluto data set and they did a lot of work with that there's always you know as, as more businesses are around they'll help I think making it accessible and make licensing it right are the two big things do I have just maybe one more question yes sir Okay, do you have perspective on uh, what the hope was when Steve Coast went to Microsoft? Funnily, I was at Microsoft right, and Bing Maps right, then, right. and I knew nothing about what was going on, which is yeah. probably telling in its own way. Uh, but do you have perspective on sure. what well, that I, was about? You know, and I have hearsay. Hear no, um, so I was at MapQuest, and Steve Coast went to Microsoft at the same time. And this was like, I guess this was 2010, and I, in my head I was like, this this is it. Like, this is businesses that are going to do this. Like, right, because both companies spent tons of money on proprietary data sets. And with Steve there and me at AOL MapQuest, I was like, well, you know, we'll definitely do something really interesting here. I think, I think a lot of businesses look at OpenStreetMap and are, you know, maybe not all in strategy wise, but, but interested enough to, to do some, some investment there. And I think Steve was, was part of an, some interest from Microsoft. But, you know, obviously that didn't turn out exactly like that. But, Maybe next year. All right, thank you.